بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful الله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا ايها الذين امنوا قوا انفسكم واهليكم نارا نارا وقودها الناس والحجارة عليها ملائكة غلاظ شداد عليها ملائكة غلاظ شداد لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمرون يا ايها الذين كفروا لا تعتذروا اليوم انما تجزون ما كنتم تعملون يا ايها الذين امنوا توبوا الى الله توبه نصوحا عسى ربكم ان يكفر عنكم سيئاتكم ويدخلكم جنات تجري من تحتها الانهار يوم لا يخز الله النبي والذين امنوا معه نورهم يسعى بين ايديهم وبايمانهم يقولون ربنا اتمم لنا نورنا واغفر لنا انك على كل شيء قدير يا ايها النبي جاهد الكفار والمنافقين واغلظ عليهم وماواهم جهنم وبئس المصير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين ونصلي ونسلم على افضل الخلق اجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين وبعد we commence by praising allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending blessings and salutations upon muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless him and all his companions his entire household may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every single one of us our offspring and may he make us from amongst those who can improve our own condition and who can help our children and the coming generations improve their condition as well and we ask the almighty to grant us the ability to be able to prepare tomorrow's leaders today my beloved brothers and sisters in islam firstly i would like to extend some gratitude and thanks to the Auckland Park Academy of Excellence for hosting and arranging this evening's function and the topic i was given to speak about as you know is raising tomorrow's leaders today when we speak about tomorrow's leaders we are speaking of our own children the youth amongst us those offspring that allah has blessed us with even if we don't have children ourselves the fact that the ummah has children we 
are meant to be very keen in the development of the children of the Ummah. Because tomorrow we need leaders who will be able to face the challenges which will be greater than today's challenges. And as you know, every year there are greater challenges than the previous year. As much as the world is becoming technologically very advanced, they are becoming very backward in terms of understanding and tolerance sometimes. And they are becoming very backward in terms of leadership and the understanding of leadership. Sometimes we are not short of leaders, but sometimes we are short of people who acknowledge leadership and want to follow. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us leaders and may he make us recognize leaders in our midst and may he make us realize and understand that not every time will we be able to have everything our way but sometimes we need to understand what others are saying and for purposes of leadership we sometimes need to give up our opinion may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and understanding there are many ways of tackling this topic and as you know muslimin we are fortunate to have with us the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the lives of the illustrious Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the way they dealt with matters, the way they prepared their own children to be the leaders that we today call the pious predecessors. And the way Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself treated not only his own offspring, but even the children of others, his relatives, as well as all other children, especially the orphans, knowing that he himself was an orphan. And I'd like to start off by making mention of the virtue of an orphan child. He who does not have a father, at the age before the age of puberty, is considered an orphan. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be an orphan. One of the reasons is for those who are orphaned to know that leadership is not restricted to those who have both parents. Sometimes you have a greater leader in someone who may have had some form of, should I say, lack within their parental presence, but they may be leaders just like Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Parental presence from birth was not as we would have liked. In the sense, for myself and yourselves, a perfect condition would be when both parents are there. But look at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who can take care of orphans. Those from our own families, extended families, as well as those from the families of the Muslimin and even others. Remember, the impact we have on the non-Muslims also plays a great role in depicting the leadership qualities we have because Islam is not just patented to those who are already Muslim but even those who are not yet Muslim may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness this evening I have prepared a 20 point plan usually you may hear me saying when you have a cough you need a teaspoon at a time so we have 20 mils each point is one mil and after we've completed our 20 mil obviously it's not going to be every single point of developing your communication with the generation that is slightly younger than you there will be points that may come to your mind and mine later on and there will be a lot that we will still need to benefit from but at least this is a beginning one of the first points i'd like to make mention of is to praise your child point number one it is very important to praise your child and to praise the children of the muslimin the children whom you would like to be leaders of tomorrow to say a good word in front of others. Oh, mashallah, well done. Oh, you're looking so good, alhamdulillah. You've done so well, even if they come up with four out of ten in the examination. So what? You've done well. They got four questions correct. Why do you want to concentrate on the six mistakes they made in public? When you, when you praise your child in the presence of others, you naturally develop that leadership quality within the child by making them feel that they are loved and appreciated and the goodness in them can always be developed later on perhaps you can add 
you've done very well next time you will even do better subhanallah so a word of positive encouragement in a positive way remember praise your child in the presence of others point number one and this point under it we would also be able to understand that when you want to admonish your child only if they deserve admonition make sure it is not in the presence of others because the amount of self or the feeling of should i say the, the self-destruction that is caused within a child by hearing their own parent admonishing them aloud in the presence of others is really something we would not like it is something that will result in the loss of the confidence of the child imagine we walk into a mall and we've seen muslims doing this you know people who are dressed islamically and this is why it's important we raise this your child begins to yell or for example they cry in the public or sometimes they are asking for a specific toy being a bit stubborn that is the quality of a child you need to develop the leadership qualities in that child to make tomorrow's leader how are you going to treat a child the child's job is to cry your job is and the world is watching you how to handle the child when the child is crying you know we've seen muslims slap their children two smacks on the face in the presence of everyone and tell them you better shut up i don't even like to use that word you know if we use the word shut up really it's very very bad we have a substitute that is far more inviting of the leadership qualities in our children if we were to say keep quiet keep quiet serves not the same purpose it actually is a much higher word than shut up shut up shows a lot of frustration and inability within the person who said it it shows that this person is so frustrated they don't have a leadership quality in them to actually speak with respect to their own child how is that child going to speak with respect to others may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us so bottom line here and we're going to get to this inshallah we will see it throughout tonight's talk that we need definitely to develop within us leadership qualities for our children to watch and for our children to appreciate and learn from point number two never make your child feel that he is useless this is something that is connected to point number one but it's a separate point because it is broader and it is far greater sometimes it can happen without even a comment just with you know the way you treat the child it can happen they feel useless by favoring one over the other they are taught that when we grow older there are some who are more deserving of rights than others because that's what their parents did so when you have children the issue of being equal and equality within your children is stressed by muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam you know a man wanted to give a gift to one of his children at the time of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked him have you given the same to all your children he said no the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told him give everyone or don't give anyone subhanallah so you give to all your children you make sure they are equal even sometimes if one of them might be slightly unruly your challenge is to develop the qualities of goodness within the unruly child consider it a point of your failure if the child becomes unruly to the degree that you are now stressed and so on may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us choose the best schools for our children and you know coincidentally here we are sitting at this function which was organized by this academy of excellence in auckland park and really we appreciate all those who are struggling and striving i see in our midst some from other schools muslim schools and so on may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you strength it is not an easy task muslim parents are the toughest to deal with and i'm saying that and i challenge you i have come across so many and i'm telling you those who have the biggest complaints when they are in a muslim school are the muslims themselves if there is a non-muslim school that has bigger negative points than a muslim school muslim parents feel too small to complain sometimes and they feel too small to raise their voice but because we know the mudir or we know someone who is in charge we want to make a big noise about things may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us deal with crises that there may be in the schools we send our children to in a manner that will solve the problem and resolve it so respectfully that our children will learn how to solve problems allahu akbar we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our doors and grant us goodness so never make your child feel useless in fact allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us all as human beings do not feel like a write-off you are written off 
قل يا عبادي الذين أسرفوا على أنفسهم لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم Oh Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم Tell those of my worshippers who have transgressed against themselves They should never lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah will forgive all their sins This verse has so much goodness in it It helps us feel a feeling that we are not useless We are not a write-off There is always hope In fact the ulama and mufassireen have made mention Of a person who feels that Allah is not merciful is actually falling into the clutches of the devil a person who feels that they've now committed sins that will never be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually falling into the clutches of the devil look at the mercy of Allah so if this is the quality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instilled within us to feel that we are always within reach of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we should make sure that our children also feel within reach of the success that lies in this world and the next may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant it to us the third point every time we speak to our children speak with respect use polite terms thank you jazakumullahu khaira please you know, when you are asking them something, don't you say, please, you know, give me the water. Say, please, can you pass me the water? Even if it's your child. We normally scream from the corner, Maryam, give me the water. Okay, that's typical Muslim home, isn't it? Gimme. G-I-M-M-E. We even type it, mashallah. But we should be saying, please, can you pass me the water? Speak with language that is not colloquial. Try that out. Speak with proper language, not slang. Try speaking with your children in language that is clear without slang. And wallahi, you will find them speaking to others in a manner that when you hear them, you are proud of them. My son, yesterday a child came to me in the masjid, one of my friend's children. And wallahi, this is exactly how he spoke to me. He said, you know, I was speaking to my father. And this is like an eight-year-old child or nine-year-old. I'm not so sure of the age. I was speaking to my father yesterday. And he told me that I should ask you and so I would like to know from you what is the ruling of playing chess the way he spoke I looked at him I said mashallah this youngsters he said you know perhaps you might be able to assist me in this because I haven't understood it and I'm looking at the child and I'm saying subhanallah you know I just said alhamdulillah mashallah he must be wondering what is this man going on about but the reason is hats off to those parents who can speak to their children in a way that wallahi, they learn the manner of speech from their own children. Oh, sorry, from their own parents. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So remember, when you speak to your child, be polite. It teaches the child to be polite with others. Do not swear, because when you don't swear, the child will not swear when it comes to others. When the child swears, you can always tell the child, you know what? This is not supposed to be the case. We can admonish the child within limits of admonition. Within the limits of admonition. And at the same time, we need to make sure that we have done it in a place that is acceptable, where the child will understand this is me and my father, or me and my parents, or just our family. In fact, it's not even so advisable sometimes in certain matters to admonish your child in the presence of the other children. Sometimes deal with it privately. The child will really respect you because you have not dropped the child even in the eyes of his own siblings or her own siblings. Amazing. And this is the teaching of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanallah. We look at his sunnah and we find he spoke fusha. He spoke the clear language. And he even said, do not speak slang. It will reduce your respect. Subhanallah. For me and you. You speak slang, it reduces your respect. Sadly, that's what we're used to today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a clean tongue with simple words that people can understand. Point number four. You need to bear in mind when your child is young that this is just a child. Don't expect them to be adults. Sometimes your child is four years, five years old and you expect them to come up, you know, neat and smart. Their clothes might be soiled or dirty. They might mess a little bit, you know. You have a child who might play in the mud. That's children for you. Let them do something that belongs to that age group. Subhanallah. Do not treat your child like an adult when they are only nine, ten years old. Perhaps they need time to play now what we mean by do not treat them as adults we're talking of by taking away their playing time 
and some of the qualities that they may have out of being children. So when you see a child, for example, playing in the mud, you don't have to always stop them. You can set aside a time where they are in the sand pit. In fact, some of the schools or the, you know, the grade zeros, we call them, those who are, you know, just prior primary age, perhaps nursery or creche, some people might call it that. They have sand pits where the child is encouraged to play in the sand, subhanallah, because that is the age. They have jungle gyms. You want a child 20 years old to play in the jungle gym? No. You know, when I was young, subhanallah, I remember being carried by my mother. And at some stage I was understanding still. And my mother was carrying me and someone said, you know, you're spoiling the child. So my mother says, well, would I carry this child when the child is now 10, 20 years old? No. So I'd rather carry them for as long as I want now. So remember, you're not going to spoil your child by carrying them and so on. Sometimes you need to understand that is what they need. You as a dad, as a mom, how often have you carried your child? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who can treat our children within their age groups and understand and realize that they too need to lead or need to pass through that phase of life. If I can quickly tell you the other side, the flip side of it, what are the negativities that might arise if we don't do this? The child rebels at an early age because they haven't had the childhood. You know, they've always been treated as an adult. Now when they're adults, they, they go back to being the children that they were not. Because their parents did not allow them to be those children. You know, they want to go to the park, make time for them. They want to go somewhere. If it is a place that is wrong to go to, perhaps you can substitute that with a different alternative. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. May He make us parents who really can prepare tomorrow's leaders today. Point number five. We need to assist our children to make decisions. This is something important. The child must be taught to decide. Help the child to make decisions. And this sometimes you will need to speak to the child. If they want to do something, it's not wrong for them to do it. Appreciate it, praise it and let them do it. Because they feel acknowledged again. They feel like they've achieved something. They will grow. They will understand. You need to guide them. You guide them. But we help them to make their own decision sometimes. Sometimes you can guide them by talking to them. Look, you have your swimming gala tomorrow. And at the same time you have cricket. And at the same time you have Jumu'ah, for example. What are you going to do? So the child says, I think I will I'll go for the cricket. You know, so you have to help the child to make a decision. How will it arrive at a decision? So you say, look, cricket is very good and I think it's a good idea. But then what are you going to do about the salah? For example, depending on the age of the child. And then the child will say, oh, you know what? Maybe I can read the salah a little bit later. Then you say, no, but it's a Jumu'ah. So don't you think you need to read it on time? You know, it's a very important salah. So we haven't just said, no, it's not going to be like that. You're going to come here. Talk to them until they say, no, dad, you know what? I will go in the morning, then I will come for the Jum'ah and I'm going to go back. MashaAllah, that is good. You see, the child has now been taught how to manage the decisions that it makes or that he or, he or she makes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us benefit and may he make us understand and realize. Point number six. Whenever you have decisions to be made, ask your child for his or her opinion. Very important. It's closely connected to the previous point as well. So, for example, you want to buy a car. Ask your child, hey, what type of a car would you prefer? You know, you can guide them again. Listen, they will feel important. They feel that, you know, my father asks me my opinion or my mother does. They will learn to ask other people their opinions. That's a leader. The Quran says, you know, the... Uh, the affairs of the believers are decided through mutual discussion or consultation. If we have not taught tomorrow's leaders what consultation is all about, by never consulting within the home, how do we expect to create leaders? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So, consultation with your own child teaches the child to consult with others. Like the previous point, if you help the child make a decision when it grows older, when he or she grows older, she will be able to help and guide others make decisions and will know how to make decisions himself or herself. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So, in 
several matters you can ask your child what's your view you know what's your opinion and then guide the child what color do you think we should buy of the motor vehicle or where would you like to eat today uh, you know we, we're deciding to go out for example and then they name you uh, a restaurant that they heard perhaps at school which may not be halal and then you can guide them to say oh but do they have a certification you know as muslimin we're supposed to be looking at this and this and this so now you're speaking to your child they grow up asking a question whenever anyone says let's go to that restaurant the first thing that comes to their mind is my father asked do they have halal certification so i'm going to ask the same question so this is just an example but we need to learn from these examples and we need to make sure we instill this in our children many of us take this for granted and this is why we have our children, they grow, as I say, like wild grass. You see, one is when you have a good garden that's looked after all the time, beautiful, you look at it and you're so happy and excited, you know, mashallah, it's nurtured. But when you have wild grass, believe me, you know, you have the dandelion and you have everything else contaminating the whole garden, you know, a bush there and everything happens in that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. We need to know how to nurture, look after and bring up our children properly. May Allah make it easy for us. Point number seven, perhaps in the house, depending on the size of the home we are living in, we would, we would perhaps have a corner or a place or a room for that particular child. Maybe write their name in that corner. Let it be their territory. Perhaps it will add a lot of confidence for them. They feel this is my place, my spot. I have this territory. You see, there's a boundary that I have. It's mine, you know. So perhaps you might want to put something there for them and you might want to have a little corner for them. And at the same time, his achievements sometimes hang them up on the wall, even at home. No matter how, you know, weak a painting may look, the fact that it was a three-year-old that painted it, put it up on your fridge. Write their name on it. Wallahi, every time they look at it, oh, wow, you know, this is something good. And it, it, encourages them to achieve more we go to schools and we find our children's achievements on the walls of the school but we won't put it up on the wall of the home sometimes we put up prohibited animate objects on the wall but we cannot put up something that is really a painting of you know a nature that is totally permissible of our own children because we are too embarrassed right there your child's name and the age uh, at which they had drawn that particular drawing or painting, whatever it was. And this is also good for some achievements. Say they have had a test at school and they got very good results. As I said, we always praise the results. Perhaps we can prod them very gently to, to, you know, to develop. Or maybe look at why they have got poor results if they do have and perhaps address them in a way that will help them, inshallah, uplift themselves and do better. But if they've done very well, stick that up on your wall at home perhaps in their little corner in their room if possible you know imagine 100 percent for a maths test stick it up in the wall on the wall and see what happens the child will have a smile that is priceless priceless believe me and sometimes we take these things for granted may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors number eight Something very important, I should have actually started with it, but I kept it further down because, you know, once we warm up, we start digesting a bit more than at the beginning. May Allah grant us goodness. Teach your child to follow you. Reading Salah, very important. Your duty unto your maker, your child must follow your example. It is far more powerful for you to lead by example than to instruct by words. Far more powerful. And I'm sure all of us seated here have seen our children those of us who do have children, those who don't, may Allah grant you children through His blessing and mercy. I mean, we have seen them at a young age of one and two, fighting to wear the clothing we wear, or the mother, for example, wears the hijab. They fight to wear that little hijab at an age of one, two and three, when they cannot really speak yet. And they want their own musalla, and they want to read salah right next to mom. Why? Nobody told them anything. We are leading by example, our duty unto our maker, subhanallah. Allah has kept it such that they will automatically watch and they will want to achieve. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Remember, what your child sees you doing, they will remember it forever, especially when they are young and when they are that age where whatever goes in is like a seed that will germinate and grow. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So remember, your duty unto Allah, the tenets of belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to instill them within our children from this age. 
you know, sometimes something happens and you need to make a statement, you know, Allah is watching. We are not going to do this. You know, people swearing, say, Allah is watching me. If you keep saying this, the child will also say, Allah is watching me, you know, inside. And if you keep on, you know, saying, I have a duty, I've got to go to the masjid because we need to please Allah. When you get wealth or something happens, say, this is from Allah. Allah gave us the sustenance and from the sustenance, we were able to buy you something. And this is all from Allah. So I need to thank Allah for having given me and you should also thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the, the belief, the basics of belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be instilled. Speak about the angels, speak about, you know, life after death. Remember, at a young age, we should not make the children so fearful that they begin to tremble. You see, this is why the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu says, Muru abna akum bis salati wa hum abna sab'i sinin. Aw awladakum bis salati wa hum abna sab'i sinin. Start instructing your children to read salah at the age of seven. The instruction, sunnah is, the verbal statement will come out at the age of seven. What about before that? It doesn't mean that they should not be reading salah, no. But it means they should be following by example. This is what it means. And at that age, now you start prodding them with words if they haven't already got there. The reason is up to that age, they, to be honest, they are not even mukallaf. They are not even responsible for their deeds. We are helping them that the day they turn what we would term the age of puberty or what is bulugh, known as maturity in Islam, where they become responsible, their books are opened and the angels begin to write. By the time they get to that age, they're already in order. MashaAllah. They're already everything they have in place. So the way this is achieved, SubhanAllah, is by us speaking about goodness before that age. And once that age sets in, we can start warning them of punishment if they leave it. And this is when they will realize you speak to them of Jannah and Jahannam in brief before perhaps more of Jannah prior to the age of seven and eight. And thereafter, when they grow a little bit older, we can speak to them also about Jahannam and remind them and warn them to say, you know what? Jahannam is for those who are very, very bad people. Those who do not want to associate with Allah in any way. Those who swear, for example, and whatever we'd like to say, let us make sure that we do not create so much fear in our children before they are actually or they have arrived at the age of puberty to the degree that they then are fearful of Islam. Sometimes it happens. Because remember, sometimes when our children mix with other non-Muslim children, they are taught that, you know, oh, we're going to paradise, Jesus died for our sins and so on. These type of beliefs sometimes pierce the ears of the children. If we have not discussed those issues of mercy and goodness that Islam has, and Islam definitely has much more mercy than any other religion, we will be failing in our duties towards our children. How will we be able to create the leaders of tomorrow if they themselves feel like they are far from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? May Allah open our doors. Point number nine. We need to teach our children how to put forward their views when they have an opinion. And that will be by us putting forward our opinions in a correct way or correcting the child. When you, how would you like to present your statement and at the same time how to speak to others how do you address people how do you put forward your opinion when you disagree with someone how do you disagree with them we will be speaking to our children when we disagree with them in a way that we want them tomorrow to speak to world leaders when they disagree with the world leader that will start in the house you know, today you disagree with someone, the biggest swear words blurt out of the mouth of the father whilst he's on the phone. You know, this F and this B and so on. These statements and words are on the tongues of the Muslimin. Wallahi, let's not deny this. And this is why our children know bigger swear words than us. Do you know what they are doing today? They are taking a good word and amongst them they have an understanding that this is a swear word so they're actually calling you that word in your presence and everybody's laughing and you're saying oh thank you jazakallah khair thinking that it's something good that is the new age they've developed new swear words like there are new phones every day and new technology every day they have you know their minds are far quicker than us sometimes because the ram has been increased by the increase of ram in the phones subhanallah May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and a deeper understanding. Wallahi, it's a fact because you have a child who's four years old. Wallahi, they will sit with an iPad. They will perhaps know more than you in no time. I have a, my son who's five years old, plays with a game sometimes. 
And he is actually clocking it, which means he goes to triple nine or quad nine and it goes right to the end. And when I sat with it, I couldn't even get to 20 or 30 and they were laughing at me. But that's because perhaps, you know, they are children, they know. But subhanallah, look at how quickly they pick up because from that age, we need to make sure they too, not only are in line with technology, but at the same time are taught how to use it responsibly. Because remember, a lot of Muslims are hooked onto pornography. And I've been reading stats of late on the internet. And believe me, pornography is a menace. They say the Muslim countries have a greater uh, viewing of pornographic sites than the non-Muslim countries. Isn't that embarrassing? May Allah protect us. Why is it the case? So we need to teach our children. We need to show them responsibility. How to put forward your view. When you disagree with someone, it's very important. But at the same time, how to use that which is in your hands today. Remember, tomorrow they will have something far more advanced than what we have. And they will be able to use things that we perhaps might feel redundant regarding. You know, today when you have an 80 year old grandpa, he'll tell you, I cannot do with, you know, I cannot, for example, do with a cell phone, which means I don't need a mobile phone at all. I don't even know how to operate it. I will still use the little landline sometimes. Now when you get to, you know, slightly younger than that, 60 and so on, now they've started with those normal Nokia 6110s for now. And then you get a youngster or a young girl who's 14, 15, Dad, I need my iPhone 6. You say, but I haven't heard of that. You don't know, it's coming out next year in March. <laughs> they know that already, subhanallah. So they are far more advanced. We need to understand, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us responsible parents. The worst thing you could do is for your child to catch you flirting with someone else or for your child to catch you on a pornographic site or for your child, for example, to catch you doing something that is immoral. That is the worst example you can lay. Believe me, they look up to you as parents from Allah. Allah has made it such that they look up to you. And when they catch dad or mom saying things that are immoral, Wallahi, it hurts them. I know of children who have lost confidence completely, become suicidal because of an affair they've discovered of their mothers or their fathers. Believe me. And the child doesn't know who to ask, who to say anything to. This is something very embarrassing. So remember, if you have a weakness, do not display it in front of your children. So much so that good news to those parents who have the bad habit of smoking, but still smoke behind their children's backs. Please don't say I said good news to the smokers. No, we are saying something very specific. If you are smoking and you are doing it not in the presence of your children, believe me. You deserve a pat on the back because you are acknowledging that it's a bad habit. And I would not like a bad habit for my children the way I have it myself because I am preparing tomorrow's leaders today. Allahu Akbar. Today we know much more about the damage and harm of cigarette than we ever knew before. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. Point number 10. Encourage your child to ask questions and try your best to answer every single question they ask. If you don't answer it, they're going to get the answer from Bob next door. Subhanallah. Or they're going to get it from school. And what will happen? They're going to get the wrong answer. Children know too much too early these days. Believe me, I was speaking a few days ago in one of the cities here. And I said, you need to start speaking to your children about marriage from the age of 10. And... People just looked at me and I said, they know about it already from the age of nine. By the time you click in at 10, they say, dad, it is about time. We already can tell you about it. Today, they believe me, technology has made them too advanced. And when we say speak to them about marriage, we're not talking of intimate details all at once, but break the ice to say, you know what? The type of, uh, well, I've got one parent who actually told me that this is what worked for their child. Now the child, mashallah, is old, married and got his own children. But he says, I used to tease my child from the age of 10 with a child of a very, very noble man who was with a, this little girl was always well dressed, you know, Islamically and so on. And I used to always tease my son to say, I'm going to get you married to that girl. And he says it ended years later with that particular marriage. Subhanallah. So the father already from an early age, obviously nowadays, you know, parents don't really have a say in their children getting married anymore. But you can, you can have an indirect say by having trained your child what type of qualities to look for from the age of 10. 
You say, oh, you know what? This is too much nakedness in the girl. Allahu Akbar. You're supposed to look for someone who can be, you know, a motherly figure. And so on from a young age it's important in whatever way you feel appropriate for your child because different children have you know different levels but you need to break the ice somehow say something open the doors and keep them as a close buddy and friend of yours so when they want to ask a question it comes to dad it comes to mom mom you know what today i saw x say this or do this they must come to you and you, you've then got to say don't swear and so on but you've then got to tackle the question and thank allah that they asked you not someone else you know when they come to you confessing their crime thank allah it's you do not punish them in a way that they will never ask you a question again or they will never confess to you they will never say something to you they've done something wrong they will come to you if, if you find out or if they have confessed believe me Confession, I think, deserves a, a lighter admonishment than if you were to catch them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and may He make our children really true leaders such that they can be even better than us. I mean. So, just to repeat that point, we teach our children and encourage them to ask questions. They must question anything they want to question and learn to answer the question. If you don't know it, say, look, Tomorrow or by next week, we'll have the answer of this and go and find out and you know what this will do This will help your child not to be conned by people They will learn to ask why is this man saying this? Why is this man doing this and then we need to teach them how to surrender to revelation when they ask a question and the answer is a verse of the Quran They might then ask well, why do we do it? So then you say you know what because we are Muslims and it's a verse in the Quran so as Muslimin, we surrender to what Allah says, whether we understand the detail of it at that moment or not, perhaps as we grow, we will begin to understand more. So now the child will know that sometimes I may not have a direct answer. If the Almighty says, for example, and I'm going to give you a typical example. I've been asked the question several times. When you break wind, you need to make wudu, you need to make ablution, but you never wash the point of breaking of wind. Allahu Akbar, I'm trying to word it respectfully, inshallah. You wash, for example, your hands and so on, but you broke wind. So the child says, but dad, why don't we wash there? Makes sense. Very good question. Praise the question. Say, brilliant question. The question came to my mind as well. Tell them. So they feel encouraged to ask more questions. And then you said, you know what? It is something spiritual that has been ordained and instructed by the Almighty. And sometimes we may not be able to see physically the benefit of it, but spiritually there is great benefit. The angels protect us and so on, and we are protected from jinn kind and from whatever else and so on. And mashallah, you can carry on with the answer. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us benefit. Point number 11, always fulfill your promises unto your children. If you tell your child, come here and I give you a sweet. When they come there, give them the sweet. If you achieve this, I take you to Makkah. If they achieve it, Take them to Mecca. Subhanallah. And this is why don't make big promises that you cannot fulfill. Because that teaches the child to make false promises. That's what it teaches the child to do. So the child, when, they, when the child grows up, he or she will promise the spouse, you know what, I promise you two years we live with the in-laws. After that, we've got our own separate place. <laughs> Look at everyone laughing here. All too common, isn't it? Well, perhaps they had parents who also did the same thing. And they always, you know, said a statement to make you happy. When the time came, they were something else. May Allah help us fulfill our promises to our wives, to our husbands, alhamdulillah, and even to our children. So make small promises. You know, you say, look, two years, inshallah, we'll live. Then we'll see what happens. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. I've entered territory that I should quickly exit from, inshallah. So it's very important for us, subhanallah, to fulfill the promise to our children. And as I said, don't make too big a promise that you know you won't be able to fulfill. And if for some reason you were unable to fulfill a promise you made, you need to explain properly. You need to really perhaps do something else which will please the child and perhaps make the child realize your complete inability to fulfill that particular promise that you've made for the child. Point number 12, very important to teach our child how to develop the skills of being a member of a group. This is something important, it might sound a little bit difficult, but let me explain it further. 
You see, team effort is something that is very, very important when it comes to leadership, development, community development. How sometimes when we're a group of people, your opinion may not be the opinion that is chosen. It doesn't mean you leave the team. It doesn't mean that. For as long as it is an acceptable opinion, you need to continue with the team. You know, sports, obviously, ulama have said a lot about sports, you know, positive and negative. I believe that we can utilize sport in order to develop certain qualities that we can nurture and enhance within ourselves and our children. You know, competition is important within certain limits. And at the same time, it teaches you teamwork. You know, football, I have no time for football, but what I do know is when we were in school and we used to play football, one thing we learned is without passing the ball, you don't win. No matter how powerful you are in terms of, you know, kicking a ball and dribbling and so on, if you do not pass that ball, believe me, you won't win. It, it taught me a lot. Although I gave it up, we only played it because it was compulsory and I gave it up very quickly. But up to today, believe me, I have developed within myself or tried to develop you know passing on something to someone else that sometimes you feel perhaps you can do a better job but give them a chance give them an opportunity even if they happen to kick and miss the goal so what you gave them a chance to kick perhaps they are developing you know today you have ulama sometimes and i'm talking of my own field you know they'll tell you don't give that man a platform and when i sit i say platform belongs to allah you can block platforms from anybody and everybody. But believe me, if Allah wants to give a platform to a man, you'll never be able to block it by the will of Allah. We learned that from a very young age. Give everybody a chance. You know, let everyone have their say. Let them have their peace. Let them develop. They will also learn. They will come through. They will come with experience. If you ask me, how did I start? I can spend a moment to tell you how I started. I remember the first lecture I gave was a lecture that I had written, which was so harsh on the virtue of Jumu'ah and the khutbah and how it is haram to speak when the khutbah is on and so on. And I was newly graduated, you know, perhaps a while after I graduated and I came up with a paper and I was shaking in the masjid, 15 minute talk in the town masjid in Zimbabwe. And I was shaking and I read this thing from the beginning to end. I had read it before and it took me 15 minutes. But when I read it in front of everyone, it took me seven minutes. I don't know how I was shaking when I looked at the time. Now there was dead silence in the masjid. I'm talking of myself. Today I'm speaking to you like I've never had a problem. I was one of the worst public speakers ever. Believe me, I was so shy to take part in public speaking that I used to try and duck and dive. I perhaps might have even been absent sometimes from school days because of the embarrassment of getting up and speaking to people. But perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the dua of people and this is something important it's not one of the 20 points but I can add it on make dua for your children a lot of it every time pray for them don't lose hope no matter what keep on praying for that child come what may it is your child even sometimes if the child has gone astray slightly may Allah bring them back never lose hope that is your child your responsibility by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so I read this and now I'm looking at the crowd you know and I don't know what to do and, I'm, and one old uncle, Allah grant him Jannah, he was sitting in front of me. He told me, son, and I looked at him, he said, read it again. Imagine, a sentence solved my problem. He saw seven minutes gone, there's still another eight minutes. All he told me is, son, read it again. And that's it. And I said, oh, mashallah. And I started reading it again. I read it better than the first time. It was repetition for those who were there, who were very few. You know, we all like to go late for Jumu'ah, don't you agree? And it was actually a repeat for those who came late and it was more relevant for them. And I said, look at that. And today, mashallah, because of that type of, you know, treatment where somebody helped me develop skills. If they told me right from this day, you're not going to speak again because you don't know how to dribble the ball. I'm giving you an example. I would have been the worst, but they gave me a chance. They told me, no, go for it. Go for it. Go again. Come on. Because that's what might have saved the child from, you know, this is now just a patchwork. We're calling it patchwork. I'm not saying that's the ideal thing to say to your child, but sometimes you have to do patchwork because the child is losing their head, becoming depressed, you know, starting to suffer depression to the degree of the need of medication. If that is the case, just because you fail, believe me, big deal. I know of so many people who are top doctors today 
or maybe not so many, but a few who tell me we failed six or seven times when we were in high school. Nobody asks them, you know, when they're about to uh, slit your belly as a surgeon, doctor, what did you get for matric? Did you pass first time or tenth time? He says, hang on. He tells the anesthetist, inject him. <laughs> Why? Because they're fed up. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. What happens? You, you might fail once, you try again. Again, try again. And you continue until one day you get it. Perhaps drop your subjects to two at a time. You will get there. But remember, where there is a will, there is a way. We need to teach our children how to relate to failure and how to respond to it, how to react to it, and how to rise above that issue. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Point number 17. When you have made a clear-cut error, apologize to your child. Don't feel too big to say, I'm sorry. I really, I apologize. It will not happen again. You teach your child how to admit fault. Some parents think never ever admit your, your error. You know, whether it's in the presence of your daughter-in-law, son-in-law, or son or daughter or anyone, you never ever say, I'm sorry. I think it's, it's a cultural thing sometimes. Some cultures perhaps, you know, promote that type of behavior and think it's merit. Wallahi, it is a source of failure. When you do not say, I'm sorry, when you do not admit your error, when there is a clear-cut error, Wallahi, the chances of you engaging in proper tawbah with Allah are diminishing. Because then there will come a time when you won't even want to admit your errors with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You teach your child to justify. People say, you know what, I committed adultery, but hey, you know what, I'm telling you, if you knew the condition I was in at that time, why are you presenting excuses? Just say, look, I made a mistake, I was totally wrong, I'm not going to do it again, it's over. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never make us utter ifs or buts when we are engaged in repentance. Because one of the conditions is to admit wholeheartedly that you have erred, you are wrong. And to feel the regret. That is when Tawbah is accepted. How are you going to teach your child to say or to admit their fault when you've never admitted your fault to them when they were clearly watching and you perhaps made a mistake in their regard? So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us benefit and to make us from those who can always, whenever it happens, admit our error and apologize even if it means to our own children. Number 18, have a few surprises for your children. Keep a day when you give the child a surprise. You know, you present to them a token of appreciation now and again, something they're really dreaming for. Once in a while, perhaps give it to them. It really enhances and boosts their deeds of goodness. So. To praise a deed of goodness, sometimes set aside a day, one day, and you say, you know what? I've bought this for you because of X, Y, and Z. The schools do this. Why do they do it? Because they want the children to excel. They have a day at the end of the year, sometimes even a weekly badge nowadays, that you know the best child in the week, here it is. Best effort, which means if you were a, a child who always got 3 out of 10 and now you've got 5 out of 10, the fact that you've shot up by so many percentage, you've done better than all the others. One who was 9 out of 10 and is still 9 out of 10, perhaps the one who's now got 5 after having 3 deserves a badge. So if you have given the child recognition of that effort, it will prod them to make a greater effort and achieve even more. So this should happen even in the home. You need to acknowledge the child. The Prophet ﷺ really used to acknowledge goodness even from children you know they were one of the battles the prophet sallallahu made two of the companions wrestle with one another and he awarded the winner by saying okay come you come with us no problem subhanallah the prophet sallallahu he spent a lot of time with children he took his time when he saw a child he stopped he paused if he could and he would actually spend much more time that is development of tomorrow's leaders that is where we had the sahaba radiallahu anhum and he says, Subhanallah, they were heroes, they were superstars. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us even a little bit of that. So it's important for us to acknowledge or to set aside a day where we have surprises or a time, some either in a month or in a week or in a year, depending on the size of that particular prize or something that comes as a surprise. You know, suddenly tomorrow, or oh, we're all heading where holiday where Mauritius dad are you sure you know that type of thing for your child to say that to you or a family member wallahi it is something that can 
increase the love in the home and it will definitely develop the good qualities point number 19 this is also a very important point that we should have mentioned far ahead but I've left it intentionally towards the end because when we go sometimes we remember the last few points you know there are many points people must be thinking you wanted us to take notes you should have told us food will be sold outside and please bring your pens and papers don't worry this is recorded by the will of Allah in no time it will be on the net by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we need to make sure that we train our children to read a portion of the Quran daily Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar the praise of Allah portion of the Quran not too much that the child becomes lazy you know people make ta'aleem they read a book at home this ta'aleem sometimes 20 minutes the child is yawning and you know sleeping and they think oh no man they want to duck and die because it's too long brother that's the capacity leave it may Allah open our doors so even if you're reading a book train them and teach them to read material that is good to question the material they're reading dad is this a good book for me to read and you need to show them how you would find out whether it's a good book or not who to ask in case you are absent one day may Allah protect our children from reading filthy books sometimes we are caught with the dirtiest of books under our pillows by our own children and then we expect them to read Quran you know it's a shameful act may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us and protect us the last point we have for this evening and this I've kept it for the end intentionally, mashallah, as I, I've, I noted these points down, you know, bringing it in from another source. The point that was one of the most powerful points, not to say that any one of them was not strong, is tell your child repeatedly how much you love your child. Repeatedly utter the statements, show your child, say that you love the child I love you my child you are the most important person how gorgeous you are even if they might have a little defect here or there you have to make mention as an amana from Allah how gorgeous the child is how you feel the child is the most important person or your children are most important to you the same applies to our spouses we need to utter these words and then another very important point is to hug them to embrace them with a good solid embrace you know some people the problem is I was speaking about this earlier. I read this point to my wife and she said, oh, they need to learn from you. Allahu Akbar. Allah accept us. Allah grant us goodness. The worst thing is to embrace your wife with such a weak embrace like you don't even want to embrace her. Give a solid hug, mashallah. Not so tight that you break her back, but alhamdulillah, you know, a solid reassuring hug, tight, lasting long, you know, and mashallah, encompassing. I mean, that's your, your, your mahram. Come on. And your children, you embrace them. Obviously, when the daughter becomes of age and so on, there is a different way of dealing with her. But we need to understand that's my child. I need to embrace my child. I need to kiss my children. It's a sunnah to kiss your children. Do you know that? May Allah, Allahu Akbar, may Allah grant us that. Make sure you've, uh, you know, brushed your teeth after the cigarette. Because they may never want to kiss you and you might not know why. Allahu Akbar. So... I have made mention of these points. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness. I haven't looked at the time today, but I'm sure I've overshot. And at the same time, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness. Alhamdulillah, I see the alertness in, everybody, in, in everybody's eyes. I hope and I pray the few words we've uttered will definitely help us raising tomorrow's leaders today. And as I said, there is much more to it than just the 20 mils. But inshallah, we've started with the bottle. The rest of the 100, we can continue getting it. Inshallah, I see some doctors in my midst as well. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all cure from the diseases we may have, whatever they may be. Until we meet again, we say, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayka.